All right. I assume that a few people are going to still trickle in from lunch, but my first uh, three or four minutes is just introduction, so uh, we'll get started while more people trickle in. Um, welcome to my Italian C++ 2023 talk, New Algorithms in C++ 23. My name's Colin Hipshire. I go by code underscore report. Getting some feedback here. We'll try not to stand too close to wherever they are. Should I be standing somewhere? Yeah. Is it better over here? Well, no one knows better than all of you. All right. <laughs> it's the same everywhere? All right, well, hopefully the feedback wasn't going to be too bothersome. Um, I really apologize for the, like, it's the whole conference, but the light wash in the room. If you're watching this on YouTube, you obviously can't tell. But uh, the live attendees, try and sit closer to the front if you can, because there's a lot of code in this talk, and it's very hard to make out what's on the slides in some of these. Um, if you do happen to have a laptop or a cell phone with an internet connection, you can go to my Git, I believe, there, uh, content, and then go into the top subdirectory, and then go into the uh, Italian C++ 2023 subtitle. There's a PDF version of these slides, so it might be easier for you to follow along on your phone, and then uh, at least for the code examples. If not, do your best to try and make out what's here. Uh, yeah, first thing I want to kind of, you know, offer the elephant in the room. I didn't really check the speaker schedule until a few days ago, and you might notice a small pattern here in the lineup. Anybody? Anybody can tell what it is? Yes. It's completely uh, male. And uh, that's not great. I think this is probably the first conference I've ever attended where there wasn't at least one non-male speaker. Um, anyways, I think C++ in general, folks would agree that there's a bit of a, a diversity issue. So hopefully in the future, 2024 Italian C++, we can try and diversify this a bit because if I had known this, I probably would have tried to work with Martha to figure out um, if that meant giving up my slot or trying to extend an extra slot or something like that. Because I think Core CPP just happened a few days ago and they had about 15% uh, non male speakers. Anyways, we have a point to get out because uh, compared to other communities, we can definitely be better than this. Enough of that, though. Uh, uh, Quick about me, so I've been working in industry for about 10 years now. For the last four, I've been working at NVIDIA. Uh, we make GPUs, obviously, you probably know. For the entirety of that 10-year uh, period, I've been a C++ developer. Um, I, for a couple of years, was helping evolve the uh, ISO C++ language and library into a few committee meetings. Um, but I'm a polyglot programmer, so on top of C++, I know a bunch of other languages. Haskell, at one point, if you're familiar with that language, was my favorite language. And um, more recently, there is a category of languages called array languages, which we're going to see a little bit of in this talk that um, have become my favorite languages. A couple other things, I have a YouTube channel that I go by Ken underscore report. I have a Twitter, you can find me Ken underscore report. I also have a programming languages virtual meetup where we cover textbooks, the first of which was the structure and interpretation of computer programmers. And I also have three podcasts, um, some of which you might know. So these are the two that you probably care about. Um, I know Nick, I believe, said he was a listener. So Algorithms uh, Plus Data Structures Equals Programs is a podcast that I hold with one of my coworkers and good friends, Bryce Welbeck, who's also on the ISO C++ committee. We talk about C++ and a bunch of other related programming things. I also have a podcast on array languages if you're interested in that. Um, here are all the symbols, as well as if you care about running. I believe most of you don't, but I'm an avid runner as well, and I have a running podcast. Um, yeah. So once again, if you want to follow along on the slide deck, uh, the content repo is what it are looking at. And also, you know, there's going to be a lot of code in this talk. Um, usually, I put uh, DOM built links at the beginning, at the bottom of all my slides that have code on them. Uh, but instead, I basically created a markdown file that lives in the same editor so that you can just go directly click on a hyperlink to each of the code examples. So if you don't want to follow the slides, but you do want to work with this on DOM built, you can just go to the links.md uh, markdown file, and that'll take you straight to the uh, DOM built where you can mess around with this interactively. So this is the high-level overview and the talk. I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about my mental model of algorithms as they exist in C++ 23 today. 
and then we are going to do a short warm-up question, and then we're going to spend the majority of the talk on a problem that I call Sushi for Two. Um, if we had time, we'll go into Matt's gap. And my guess is we're not, because I spent a lot of time talking about the Sushi for Two problem, but if you have time at the end, uh, we will go through a, a second problem after the warm-up. So, algorithm land overview, at least in C++. Um, I consider there to be three different verticals of algorithms in C++. Up into C++20, there was sort of just one vertical, and that was algorithms. And I'm referring to them here as iterator algorithms. Because now in C++20, we have basically range versions, range overload versions of these algorithms. So you can see that we've got a few examples on here, the first of which is find if. The only difference between these two examples is that we're passing two different iterators in the C++ 98 version that defines our sequence. Whereas in the C++ 20 version, we can do it with the iterators. We just pass the container, testing. Oh, to fix the feedback? All right. Um, it sounds better, yes? Yay. Hey, a little, little applause for the tech coats. Uh, so these are two of the three verticals, C++ 98, and during uh, 98, you know, and C++ 11, 14, 17, they added a bunch of new algorithms. In 17, we got a bunch of overloads for the parallel algorithms. So I consider those all iterator algorithms. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah? All right. C++ 20, we add the range overload. And so these are two different verticals. One is the iterator algorithms, and one is the range algorithms. Everything that we're going to be focusing on in this talk, though, is in the third vertical, which is, I refer to them as algorithms, but technically in the standard, they're referred to as ranges, and specifically range adapters and range factories. So a factory is something that generates a sequence like IOTA. You start with a single number, and it just generates you an uh, incrementing sequence. An adapter is something like transform or filter. It takes a sequence and does something to it. So these technically aren't referred to as algorithms in the standard, but in my mental model, I refer to all three of these things as algorithms, and it's just, this is the way that I sort of, there's three different verticals that, you know, colorize them, whatever you want to do. Know that there's the iterated algorithms, there's the range overload algorithms, and then there's these sort of ranges land, which is different than the range overloads, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So, here I'm showing five different range adapters, but there are a ton. So, if we colorize these, so the ones in the left are from C20, and the ones on the right are from C23. However, this is just a fraction of the ones that exist. If we enumerate all of them, this is basically what we have in C20 and C23. And this might be the most pedagogically useful slide in this whole talk. We're going to go through and look at some examples, but I'm not going to focus a ton on the stuff in C. How many people are familiar with, you know, take, filter, drop, transform in C20? Raise the hands. That's about 25%. Okay, and how many are familiar with any of them from the C23 column? Only like three and a half, four hands maybe. So we're gonna, we're gonna focus on some from both columns. The ones that I am most excited about are the ones in the C23 one because ones in the C20 column are kind of just range versions and algorithms that already exist. So take and drop are new. That just basically takes the first n elements or drops the first n elements. That things like reverse transform, these had analogs that exist in C++ 98. So it's, it's nothing new, it's just a different way to call them, which we'll see in a sec. So we're going to do a short digression here. This is actually a, a longer digression in a different version of this talk, but I don't have a ton of time, so we, we shorten it down. And the main point is that ranges fits into a paradigm that's called collection-oriented programming. And you can think of collection-oriented programming as kind of a subset of functional programming. So functional programming deals with, you know, pure functions, immutable data, referential transparency, high order functions. That doesn't really, you know, fall into collection-oriented programming. Collection-oriented programming is just calling functions or operations on sequences or ranges. That's basically all it is. And so that I've, I've listed a couple others. Most folks are familiar with functional programming, object-oriented programming. And the reason I want to highlight this is that you might actually be familiar with languages or libraries in other languages that fit into this exact same model. So if you're familiar with Java 8 streams or Rust iterators, those are the same thing as C++ ranges. Specifically that you end up with a constant memory, O1 memory, when you're iterating over in these sequences. Whereas if you call a C++ 98 algorithm like transform three different times, you're gonna be iterating over that data 
three different times, once for each call to an algorithm. Whereas in Ranger's land, if you pipe a bunch of these adapters together, you iterate over everything just once, which is kind of the benefit of using this. Other languages like uh, Haskell, this is basically the way that Haskell will, or works by default. And APL and Smalltalk, there is the most recent Smalltalk. These are languages that don't have the sort of uh, memory requirements of O1 overhead, but uh, still have sort of a matter where you're applying operations to a certain data structure. So just small digression, collection-oriented programming, add it to your vocabulary if you haven't heard of it. And this brings us to our warm up. So this is not the point of the talk. Hopefully I'm just gonna get your brains driving with this question. It's a very simple question. The question is, given a list of numbers, filter in the odd ones. So get rid of the even numbers. So this is the basic way, or sorry, no wait, this is counting the number of negative numbers, I'm mixing up my talks here. Um, and so in this uh, example, say we had the list one, two, three, and then negative one, negative two, it would return you two because there's only two negative numbers in that list. So this is a C++ 98 version that is basically just using uh, index-based for loop, looping through each of the indexes defined by nums.size, and anytime we get a value that's less than zero, we increment our local variable count and then return that at the end. So does anybody know a C++ 11 feature that basically keeps the same structure but simplifies this code? Right. Right. Range goes four. That's the one I'm looking for. So C++ 11, 11 added a range base four. Basically the exact same solution. Nothing's changed here, but uh, it's a lot safer, less opportunity for off by one errors. You should prefer this kind of code um, if you are writing code. So the next change is just switching to uh, C++ 14's uh, deduced function return type because I prefer that. And I believe uh, we switch back to C++ 11 by using trailing return type. So the next question is, what is the name of the algorithm that can be used? I'll talk about the name. Countif is the correct answer. So here we're making a call to C++98's countif, once again, passing our two iterators because this is the C++98 version. And then uh, we actually have a C++11 lambda here. Technically, this is a C++14 lambda because we're using auto in the parameter list, so it's a generic lambda. But we can make one small change here now with C++20 and we can get rid of the dot C begin on both nums for the uh, first and end iterator and just pass nums now. So a little bit unfortunate that we have to call the ranges colon colon namespace because a part of the win of not having to call the two iterators, it's a lot shorter, but then you still have to add the namespace. So some people have uh, taken to using the namespace, you know, SD, STDR equals std ranges so that they don't need to spell that all over the place. But I want it to be explicit here. And I think my next slide because this still irritates me because our lambda here is just comparing uh, against zero. In Haskell, this takes four characters. And I need, I don't know how many that is, 20? I need both brackets, both parentheses, both braces, two semicolons, um, and then all the stuff in between. So I have a library called Blackbird that basically gives you all these short functions. And <laughs> you can't see it, but there's actually a black blackbird here um, that is completely invisible. Oh, is it actually on Spring yet? No, it's not. Can we see it? Oh, there you go. This little guy here. Um, so you have to using namespace combinators, but basically LT is a function that stands for less than, and here it's less than zero. So it just saves you a few characters, uh, which I really enjoy. So that's, that's a warm up. My preferred solution is the count if either in C++ 98 or C++ 20, depending on what version you have. But inevitably, at every single conference I've ever been to, and I've given some talk on algorithms, someone comes up to me at the end and says the following. Loops are easier to read and understand, and everybody knows what they are. Every language has them. But if I have to go learn the name of count if, you know, in Java, it's going to be some other algorithm name. In Rust, it's going to have some other name. Like, there's so much overhead to having to learn all these different algorithm names. Why can't we just use for loops like go go doesn't even have like generic algorithms they just it's for for loops across the board and there's some people that you know they'll die on this hill they, they love pointing this out and i'm so happy to be giving this talk today because finally in c 20 we're able to solve one of my favorite coding problems of all time the first time like i saw this was in 2019 in a code forces contest does anybody know code forces one person they have like 10 hands so it's similar to elite code they just have these contests that you can compete in and solve little algorithmic problems. I solved this back in 2019, and at the time I was a C++ developer, and I switched to Haskell to solve this problem because I knew it was going to be so painful to solve in C++. Anyway, so let's 
let's talk about the problem. This problem is sushi for two. So we're going to spend a few minutes here explaining this problem because the next 30 minutes of the talk or 20 minutes of the talk isn't going to make sense if you don't understand the problem. So what is the problem? We're basically given a list of ones and twos. One represent one type of fish. We'll call it the blue one tuna. And the two represents a different kind of fish. This is a puffer fish according to the Unicode emojis. So you're given a sequence or a list of vector in C++ of these ones and twos that represents tunas and puffer fish. And you and a friend are going to this restaurant and you want to maximize the amount of sushi of these fish that you can eat. But there's a bunch of criteria. The first criteria is that you only like tuna and your friend only likes puffer fish and you're only gonna eat the fish that you like. So that's the first criteria. The second criteria is that when you go to order, you have to take a contiguous set of fish. You're not allowed to pick and choose. You have to choose a range that is contiguous and select your fish from that. The third condition is that when you select a fish, you have to select basically it partitioned by tunas, all tunas, and then all puffer fishes, or all puffer fishes, and then all tunas. You can't mix and match like, so, so here, the last, the last uh, you know, five would count. You know, the first three would count. The middle, the second one, so this, this one wouldn't count. So anytime you don't have it partitioned by all one kind and then another kind, it doesn't count. And the fourth and final criteria is you and your friend have to eat the same number of fish. So you, you're not allowed to have an unequal amount. Your friend eats four and you only eat one. That's not, that's not okay. So the question is, based on all of those four criteria, what's the maximal amount of sushi both you and your friend can eat together? So based on that, the answer is four. Because this is the longest contiguous sequence that's partitioned and has an equal number of fish, two and two. So just to make sure everyone understood that, because I know there was a lot of criteria, we're going to look at one more example. And I'll let you guys think about it for a sec. Does anybody know what the answer for this is? Six. So yes, you don't need to specify the indices, just the total number at the end. So yes, it is the uh, first to seventh, as Vittorio said, and a bunch of you shouted out six. So yes, six is the correct answer. So now we all understand this problem. How do we solve this before C++20? Think about it a little bit. The details don't really matter a ton. Give me a few seconds to think about it in your head. If we have more time, you know, we could talk through it. This is an example solution. It's very hard to tell, not on YouTube. YouTube's doing great. <laughs> but uh, in the room, it's very hard to tell. We basically have a for loop here, and the first four variables are local state. You basically need to keep track of what's the current fish type that we're looking at. And what's the number of that type of fish that we've seen in a row? And what was the number of previous fish that we saw in a row? And we also need to keep track of the global maximum of what is the, you know, if we take the equal length from those two numbers, what's the global max? So that's four pieces of state. There might be a simpler solution that reduces your four pieces of state down to three pieces. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is that, you know, you can make the argument with the count if that you have a single for loop with one line, one if statement, and one local variable, that's easy enough to reason about. This is not easy to reason about at all. And there's also, it's hard to see, but at the very end, you have to take into account on the last iteration, you know, make sure that you get the, the last two, you know, tunas and puffer fishes, either or, because the loop doesn't keep track of that, right? So you either, you either have to, with an index-based for loop, check, you know, am I at the last index and do something special, or do something after you get out of your for loop. It's just a complete mess. And you know, like this, I did not write this code in 2019. I, I, I read the problem statement and immediately switched to Haskell because the Haskell way to solve this is, is so beautiful. And we're going to look at now how you can solve this in C++23. So we're not going to go through this right away. We're going to work through, we're going to work up to this, but this is now what you can do in C++23. Um, chunk by is the C++23 range adapter. Uh, so is adjacent transform, uh, and transform and max came from C20. So I believe I'm going to switch to Q. So Q is an array language. Uh, it was sold back, you know, a few years ago for $100 million. Um, so if you think there's no money in programming languages, well, the people that wrote the Q and K language uh, beg to differ. But I want to solve this in Q. So uh, this is basically SF2 is a function, and in Q, this is basically your way of spelling a, a function. So X is the argument. And it, this is just the identity function. Right now, it just if you pass it a number, it gives you back that number. So this is a, an example uh, sequence, ones and twos, ones are tunas, twos are puffer fishes. The first thing we want to do is call a function called chunk. And what chunk is going to do is it's going to split your list into contiguous sequence of equal values. So 
all the ones in a row get grouped, all the twos in a row get grouped. So you basically end up with a list of lists. Everybody understand that? It's pretty straightforward. The next thing we want to do is we want to get the length of these lists, and these lists, said lists. So we are going to basically call count each. This is the equivalent of transforming stood ranges distance in C++. So each is our transform function, count is the equivalent of our distance function. From here, we want to do something that is the equivalent of an adjacent difference, so what's now called adjacent transform in C++23, which is a prior in Q. So prior basically has an adjacent difference or adjacent transform that's called prior. This here, it's a bit cryptic, but that is basically your minimum function. So the way that you guarantee that each of you are going to eat the same amount is you take the minimum of the adjacent lengths, and that basically kind of floors the value. So if there's a three next to a two, you know that each of you can only eat two. And then once we do this, you are going to have to make a small adjustment. Um, oh, right. And so I just sort of explained. So prior in Q is what they, they call this. We have adjacent difference, which is what this was called in C++ 98. And now in C++ 23, we have uh, adjacent transform, which is a better version of this. Uh, there's a small um, fix that we have to do here. So if anyone is familiar with adjacent difference in C++ 98, uh, there's a, a really bad design problem with it. And that's that it copies the first element of the input sequence to be the first element of the output sequence, which means you're limited to having the same type from your input to your output. So, uh, you know, that's not great. Prior suffers from the same thing. And in this case, because it's doing that copying, that doesn't represent anything. There's no minimum there. So you need to get rid of that element. So this one underscore is a, a one drop. It means get rid of, so previously on the last slide, we had, you know, four ones. Now we're basically just getting rid of the, the first uh, integer. From here, we want to do another adjacent transform. We now want to, uh, actually, I think we're, we're done at this point. So we basically want to just take the maximum now and then multiply that by two. So this is how many sushis each person gets. We multiply that by two, and then that's going to change to four, hopefully. So that is the, that is the solution in Q. So hopefully that makes sense. If it didn't, we're going to do it again in C++. But I think it's easier to understand going through a language like Q because it's, it's so terse in the name of its functions. Uh, but I think for now, uh, and this is just a point-free version, so you can get rid of the braces and the X by adding a double colon at the end. But I think now we're going to switch to C++. So now we have the same thing as a brace X brace. This is just a function that takes a stood vector and returns you the same stood vector. It's called sushi here. And now we're going to do the same kind of incremental building up uh, by example to see how we can solve it. So the first thing we're going to do is make a call to a C++ 23 range adapter called chunk by. And chunk by is the exact same thing as chunk in Q, except that here, um, it doesn't have a default binary operation. So here, we're chunking by the fact that they're equal. So as long as they're equal, it keeps them in a, the same list, and then as soon as it fails that binary predicate, it starts a new sublist. So chunk by, paren, stood, colon, colon, equal to is the exact same thing as chunk and Q. The next thing we want to do is the exact same thing we did with count each. We're transforming each of these sublists just into a single number, that's the length. And what do we call that in C++? We call that distance. And note that this is stood ranges distance. I'm not actually sure if the stood distance will work. This is designed to be passable as kind of like a function object. Once we do this, we're going to make a call to the equivalent of prior in Q, which is another... C so tr transform the C++ has 20. The next uh, range adapter adjacent transform is a C++ 23 range adapter. And so... If you compare this to the paren ampersand paren prior, very sad, because I think that is shorter than just the name of the uh, range adapter in C23. And note that this is a, takes a template argument. So the beautiful thing about adjacent transform is it's generic, and it can take an arbitrary number of uh, adjacent elements. So prior is hard coded to two, but adjacent difference can take two, three, four, five, and then all you have to do is change the number of arguments your lambda takes or your function object takes, which is, which is really nice. There's actually a uh, alias for adjacent transform when the template argument is two called pairwise. I'm not showing that because I actually don't like pairwise. I think it's an extra thing for people to know about, and it's no shorter than adjacent transform. So I just prefer using adjacent transform. And uh, the last thing we need to do is then basically wrap this all up in stood ranges max that takes the max of those values. And then once again, we need to multiply that by two to get four. So. Absolutely beautiful that we can do this in C++23. There are two things about this code that are irritating, at least for me personally. Does anybody want to shout out what they think is irritating and see if it corresponds? 
exactly. So we will we will get to that in one second. So uh, to repeat what Vittorio said, um, stood range is max. We're not piping. Or we have this nice linear flow where we call chunk by and then transform and then adjacent transform. And then, no, we, we can't pipe to max. So we then need to pass that whole sort of pipeline to max as an argument. And that's irritating. Uh, there's another thing. And so I, I just heard like 10 or 15 people mutter the Lambda. So yeah, uh, it's very irritating that uh, the C++ compilers are not able to figure out which overlay we want here. So, you know, like std equal to, we saw that you can just pass straight in, but std max, because I believe it has an initializer list over there, it gets confused. So we have to wrap this in a Lambda. So we can fix that problem by using my combinator library. So here, we'll basically replace this with an underscore min underscore. <laughs> the is shaking his head, but as an API programmer, I very much like this. Once again, you have to add the combinators in the Blackbird library. And while we're at it, same as we made that, and we saved some characters with that, might as well replace equal to as well with my equal to uh, and it's underscore EQ underscore. You may hate it, but I like this a lot more. But now, how do we solve the second problem? Does anybody know? We switch to circle. So if you, if you can't tell what just happened here, right now we're calling the pipeline binary operator that is overloaded to work with all these ranges. So this is just, it's a, it's a binary, you know, it's an it's a operator that you can overload, and it's been overloaded for each of these, one of these, uh, what they call uh, range adapters. And now we're switching to use the circle compiler, which is using a proposed C++ 26 feature called the pipeline operator. So now we no longer just have a pipe. We have a pipe with a little pizza slice there. It's also sometimes referred to as the pizza operator. And note too that we now have a dollar sign placeholder as well. So previously, when we're in ranges land, whenever you use the pipe operator, it all, what it's forwarding always goes to the first argument place. But with the pipeline operator, it goes to where the dollar sign is. So in this example, it's kind of unnecessary, but in future examples, we'll see this can be very, very useful when we want to pipe something to sort of not the first place. And note there's actually a whole category of range adapters. So any range adapter that's variadic, that takes a variadic number of arguments, does not have the pipe overload, which is extremely irritating. Like the whole point of this, well, not the whole point, but one of the very nice things about ranges is that you can build up this pipeline of operations and it's, it's not nested, it's very easy to read, um, but you can't do that with any of the variadic ones, which we'll see in a sec. So note here now we've got the, the main point of this is that we've got the ranges max at the end here, which is what, as Vittorio pointed out, is the way we want to be able to read this code. So hopefully this makes it into C++ 26. For now, check it out on Gobbalt. Um, it has a, uh, they have support there for Circle. Note that if you are going to check out Circle on Gobbalt, you have to type in all of that as command line arguments because uh, Circle doesn't implement its own version of lib C++ or lib stood C++. It bears it from GCC. Um, or in that link D file, you can just go click on that link and it'll take you to a Gobbalt instance that already has this typed in. That's my recommendation. I think that's where uh, the next slide is. But Toyo, question. Explain what circle this was it all might not be you. Oh yeah, good uh, good point. I'm just assuming uh, everybody knows, but yeah. So circle is basically like a next generation C++ compiler. It's uh, uh, implemented by an individual named Sean Baxter who, who lives in the states, and it's a, it's a fully compliant, standard compliant C++ compiler all the way up to C++ 20, and he's adding C++ 20 features. But on top of this, he has implemented a whole ton of you know, proposed features from the standard, but also other things from other languages. So I think he has a traits-like system implemented, inspired by Rust. Uh, I think he has the hash embed stuff that John Heed Manit has done. So like, I basically, in preparing for this talk back in May, I, I just messaged Sean, because we know each other, we've interviewed him on ADSP, and I said, uh, you think you could implement this? Or like, you know, if you implement this, I'll turn my talk into like a circuit promotion. And he like, three days later was done and like sent me a, sent me a binary. And it was the best, like there's a few beds, but after a week we had started it all out. And uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, I, am I going to switch my daily driver to be circle? Maybe not. You know, it depends how things evolve over the next couple of years. Uh, but just like this single feature alone, um, you know, we're going to see in a sec. Like this is nice, but what we're really about to talk about is even nicer. So uh, that's what circle is. So now I think uh, we are going to compare this to Haskell. So I mentioned 2019 when I was doing this Code Forces contest. Um, this is very hard to make out. But basically, this is the exact same code. You have to read it from bottom to top. 
but it reads group, which is the exact same thing as chunk body equal to, map length, that's the same thing as transform distance, map adjacent min, that's the exact same thing as adjacent transform min, and then maximum, which is the same thing as our range is max, and then times two at the end. So we basically, like, it's a little bit more verbose, but we can write functional style, collection-oriented programming style uh, code that I love to write in Haskell, like not as performant, but now we basically have like an extremely performant version of this Haskell code. And this is juxtaposing this all just next to the Q code. And I think we're going to look at now sort of an alternative solution. So I gave, I uh, not this talk, but I showed this Q example at a conference back in May called KXCon that was held outside of New York which was a bunch of Wall Street bankers and people from Wall Street that use Q. So this, it's a very fast language and it's mostly used in the finance industry. And I gave this talk and I showed this solution and a couple of people came up to me afterwards and, and emailed me afterwards and pointed out that actually this was less efficient than it could be. So Chunk is actually not a built-in. Everything else here is a built-in, but I kind of hand-waved and Chunk has implemented uh, the following. And basically what you're doing is Differ is adjacent difference. It just looks and gives you basically trues and falses, which, which elements are equal to each other and not. Or, so this one gives you back a true, a one, when uh, they aren't equal to e each other. Where is a function that, when given a list of zeros and ones that represent trues and falses, give you back basically uh, the indices that correspond to the ones. So if you have one, zero, one, zero, one, it, where it gives you back one, three, five, the indices that correspond to each of those ones. And then once you have those indices, you can just call a function called cut, and that basically splits up your list. But the two people pointed out that I actually don't need chunk. You don't need this built-in. Once you have those indices, one, three, and five, you can just call deltas, which is a built-in function that gives you the difference between adjacent values. So if you have one, three, five, you can get the length of those sequences by just going deltas, and you get back two, two. There's one small catch is that you actually want uh, more than two, two, you want the difference with the last element as well, because deltas doesn't capture that. So you have to prepend this extra count thing. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. And in Q, calling cut materializes this nested list. And that's not great. We, we want to avoid those nested lists. I think in C++, it's actually the same thing. You're still guaranteed uh, 01 memory for both these solutions. But I just thought this was interesting. And then I decided to try and implement this solution, this alternative solution that sort of uses the uh, internals of chunk gets rid of the cut and replaces it with a delta. So once again, we're going to go through the exact same thing uh, with this solution, though. So first thing we want to do is, and note that we no longer have um, a function called uh, adjacent transform in range. So we, we're switching to range v3, which is the library implemented by Eric Niebuhr that sort of all this work is based on, because we need one range adapter called concat, which is coming in C++26. Everything else you see on, on screen is a C++23 thing. However, we don't have adjacent transform in range v3. This is basically the way that you spell adjacent transform uh, in range v3. You do a zip with, which we call zip transform in C++23, that basically takes two sequences and a binary operation and combines those two. So it's basically like a two range uh, overload of std transform in C++98. You give it two sequences and it combines them with a binary operation. The binary operation that we want to use here is not equal to. So any Q is just the short version of not equal to. And this is basically our differ. It's going to give us back the elements that aren't equal to each other when we look at them adjacent. The next thing we want to do is zip this with an iota sequence. So note that we went from sort of, uh, if we look at, at the example, we start off with the ones and twos. We call the equivalent of an adjacent transform with not equal to, and that gives us back our ones and zeros. And now we want to, we don't have the where function or the indices function that's going to give us back the one, three, five. So for the way we do that, we can hand roll that, is we zip this sequence with an iota sequence. So now your ones and zeros turn into a list of tuples, two tuples, where the second element is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The next thing we want to do is throw away everything that has a zero as the first element. And we can do that with a filter. So now we're just left with the tuples that have as a one as the first element. Does that make sense? I see a few people squinting, a few people nodding. So now we've, we've gotten rid of everything that was a zero, and now we don't care about the ones. All we care about is the indices that we got from the i. So we can get rid of the first element by going transform 
and calling second. So note that I'm using these shortcuts. FST is just a shortcut for student colon colon get uh, angle zero. It's just accessing the first element in the tuple. SND stands for second, and that's just a shortcut for student colon colon get angle black one, which is ask accessing the second element in a tuple. So we, we basically got rid of our tuple now, but there's a nicer way to spell this transform second that actually is in C++ 20. Does anybody know what it is? I always forget this, and then Barry Rebzin, who's a C++ committee member, points it out on Twitter. No, so it is a, I'm not sure if I actually put both in. So there is a uh, range adapter called elements, which does exactly this, a transform, and it takes a template argument, and that says, of a tuple-like sequence, just retrieve for me this element from the tuple. And we actually have two aliases for elements. So element zero is values, no, element zero is keys, and element one is values, which makes sense when you're working with like a hash map or a key value associative container. In this case, though, it's kind of a hack. We're just making use of it. Like whenever you have transform elements uh, one, or sorry, yeah, elements one, which is the equivalent of the transform stub colon colon get one uh, angle one angle. This is just something you can use because it's the shortest way of spelling it. But in, in my, this is the same reason I don't really like pairwise these aliases for operations because keys and values kinds of, it kind of encodes the semantics of, and this key value associative container. Whereas here we don't really need that. But anyway, so it is what it is. So the next thing, now that we have our indices, now we want to perform the deltas operation in Q. So we, or actually that's not true. We want to prepend a zero and prepend the length of the sequence. So this is what we need range V3 for. And this is, I believe we're going to do this with a concat statement. So I have actually skimmed over the importance of the placeholder. So here, this is in circle code the entire time. Note that we piped in twice this initial sequence with the, uh, with the pipeline operator. This is not possible in range land. You're only allowed to pipe something in once. And now here, now here we're doing that concat where the only thing we were doing here, we had a sequence, we're just adding, we're, we're prepending a zero and appending the length of our sequence that we get from sushi. So it's, you know, looks complicated, but it's just adding a zero and a nine to the beginning and the end. And note here that the way we do this is we concat with the single value zero, the single size of sushi, and then our existing sequence. So this is like incredibly powerful. I'm going to show you the equivalent in like ranges code, standard C++ ranges code. And like to do this, it requires you basically piping things into locals and like rearranging it. It's, it's just awful. So like the power of having a placeholder that you can pipe in twice or pipe in not to the first thing, but the second or third or fourth is absolutely amazing. And Merth and ZipWith and Zip are both very attic. They're very, they, they can take a very attic number of sequences, which means there is no support at all with the pipe operator in C++ 20 or 23 ranges, which is incredibly sad. Now that we have the full set of values that we need, um, we are going to perform hand roll our deltas function. So this is basically an adjacent difference. So we're do, doing the same zip width when we drop sort of one element to sort of a pair, uh, compare adjacent elements. But here, the operation that we're doing is subtraction. We're subtracting these, uh, these values here. And so that just gets us the difference between our indices. Once we have sort of these, these are now the equivalent lengths of our uh, sushis. Um, we now need to do another zip width. So now we're back into sort of our real solution where we're doing the min prior. We're doing the JSON transform where minimum is our binary operation. And uh, because we actually are using a JSON transform, we don't need to worry about dropping the first element. So at this point, we just pipe this to ranges max, multiply everything by two, and that's our answer. So this is obviously a lot more complicated than our previous solution. But the reason that I've included it is to highlight like the elegance of the pipeline and the placeholder feature that is proposed for C++ 26. I think, I don't have a preview, I think my next slide, and yes, this does rely on Blackbird a bit, but like you can replace all the shortcut first, second, NEQ, sub, min with, you know, the hand-rolled lambdas or the function objects in the functional header. This is the equivalent, I think, if I'm not mistaken. In C++, so actually I should, uh, well, no, I, actually, we're not, we're not showing that yet. So this is overwhelming. But if we add some helper functions to align with the built-in functions that we have in Q, we get the following. So there's no adjacent transform. And if we just create a helper function that wraps that zip with drop pattern, abstract that away, name the differ, 
name the deltas, and note that different deltas are just two specializations of adjacent transform, which is really, really neat, I think. Like adjacent transform is an incredibly useful function that I think will get utilized a lot more now that one, it has a good name, adjacent difference is a terrible name, and two, that it's in this range library. And also indices, which was called where in Q, we bump it up here. So if we now use these helper functions, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I slide by that. So in the previous solution, when we were using ZipLift, we actually uh, called the pipe drop on the first argument because when taking the uh, difference between two elements, if you just subtract increasing elements, like uh, adjacent, ad adjacent transform with uh, stood colon colon minus on the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 will give you negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. And so the trick to get around that in our previous solution was just passing the second element as our first, like dropping this one. And so you've got, you're basically subtracting two from one. In this case, we, we're using the same function. So this underscore C is actually a combinator. It's, if you're familiar with boost, it's the equivalent of boost colon colon flip. It flips your two arguments to a binary function. So instead of getting back a negative one now, it flips the arguments so you'll get back positive ones, which is what we want. Um, good question though, and great cash. I'm surprised you can make that out from <laughs> how dimly lit the slides are. Um, but so if we, if we make use of now uh, adjacent transform to differ deltas and indices, our solution that is this kind of behemoth from before um, now becomes the following, which is actually very, very similar to the Q solution. It's obviously a lot more verbose, doesn't fit on a single line, but we've now got different indices, concat, deltas, adjacent transform, and then pipe to stood colon colon ranges max. Um, and note that all of these helper functions also work with the pipeline placeholder model, whereas the, pipe, the pipeline that's implemented in C++ 20 and 23, that is something that like the, library, uh, the standard library implementers have to do. So when you write your own you know, function, you don't get to then use the pipeline operator. Like they might add some facility for you. Like I know in range V3, they have a function called make pipeable, which you can like pass a function to in order to make that function pipeable. But with the placeholder and uh, the pipeline operator, you get that for free, any function that you do. Like I'm showing this all with ranges, but technically you can go and use this with any kind of function, right? It's just, it's just a way of sort of um, term rewriting your existing code, which is super, super nice. So I think now we skip back to this, and this is where I'm gonna show the equivalent in C++. So note that zip with, zip, anything that's variadic, you can't pass, uh, you can't use the pipeline operator with. Any place where we've got, you know, uh, a value that's not the first thing, or you've got duplicates you're going to have to assign. So this is the equivalent in C++. We've got multiple locals in order to pipe them twice. We've got a combination of pipes in the middle here with passing the results of those pipes to zip lift and zip because those aren't supported with the pipe operator. So this is highly, you know, non-optimal in my opinion, like compared to what we had before where it's just a single linear flare of your operations, even if it takes a second to write this, or I like to read this one by one by one, it's going to be way easier to parse because you don't have to carry any local state in your head. You just evaluate each operation and then get down to the end and you're good to go. Um, so call your local Italian C++ uh, you know, member, talk to the Toro. <laughs> it's a minute want this feature, although I've heard that it's dead in the water. So, you know, yay for C++. <laughs> All right, what's our, our time actually? So we've got, yeah, like six minutes left. So I'll pause for questions. If there are no questions, we can burn through this example. Um, I don't know that I see that. Question, two questions. Yeah. How are these fights really? Oh, that's the worst question. I mean, it's a great question, but um, yeah, so the question was how do uh, the range adapters work with compilation time? And the answer is, uh, it can be bad. Uh, it's probably the number one complaint about both range V3 and standard ranges. Um, the way that these things work is when you're building up a pipeline, um, pretend these are you know C++ 20 and 23 uh, range adapters. It basically, until you call some like evaluation or materialization function at the end, like ranges max, it builds up a nested structure of the views that are behind these things. So you start off with a zip width view, and then that becomes the template argument of a zip view, and then that becomes the template argument of a filter view. So you end up like, if you ever have a compiler error and you see the result of this, you get this type that is like crazy long because it's a nested template mess 
of all of these views. And the more and more you nest them, the worse and worse your compile time gets. So if you talk to Eric, who's like the mastermind behind this stuff, he probably would see this and say, you know, don't do this. Like, like there's a, you want to, you want to break them and evaluate them in order to minimize compile time. But it's also early days. Like GCC 13.1 was the first compiler to implement like a full set of these. And that happened just in May. So like two months ago. So, uh, yeah, compile compilation time will suffer. Your mileage may vary. I'll ask the yellow question, uh, yellow t-shirt first and then come to you. I'm on the all the documents in all 98 of the document and both of them, uh, the new range of what term you uh, so the, to repeat the question, um, is it specifically with the initial warm up example, like the count if, or just. Yeah. It, 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 all we are back. Back slower or. Yeah. Okay. So the, in general, the question is what's the, uh, so the first question was about compilation performance. The second question is about runtime performance. Um, for the right applications, ranges code should be much faster. Because the, the, the point that I made at one point in the talk is that when you make multiple calls to algorithms in C, before C++20, whether that's 98, 11, 14, 17, every single time you make a call to an algorithm, the compiler can't see through those algorithms and fuse everything into a single pass. Like that, certain compilers do have loop fusion optimizations, but it is in a very like sandboxed environment that they're able to, to see that, oh, we have one loop followed by another loop, we can do loop fusion here. So if you're making a call to a transform and then another call to a std transform and then finally a call to a count if, that at the end of the day is going to do one pass for the first transform, another pass for the second transform, and then do a reduction. So in the worst case, like if you're making a, a call to an algorithm like adjacent difference, like a lot of times you have to allocate memory for the resulting sequence from your adjacent difference, difference if you can't do it in place. So there's a whole memory allocation that you're doing. And in this example, we're doing three of those. We're doing three effective adjacent differences, it's, which would require then three potential memory allocations, maybe that you can reuse, but it, at worst, real, best case, you still have to iterate individually each of those sequences. What the ranges model does, you build up that entire pipeline, and then it, it one, it doesn't memory, uh, it doesn't allocate any memory, and two, it does a single pass. So like for the right applications, like I can, I can design certain problems and then, you know, run the uh, runtime performance and like ranges would blow it into the water. Inevitably, someone in the crowd would say, well, that's a, that's a hand-picked cherry, you know, example that makes ranges look really good. And I would answer that, yes, of course. Um, and I think, I think for other cases, like, it's probably, in the worst case, going to be just the same as what it is. Um, like, if, if you're having to allocate, you're going to be making calls to certain utility functions called ranges to, like, std vector. And in that case, that's just the equivalent of what you were doing before. So I would go as far to say that, like, you know, ranges, in all cases, should be the same if not way faster. And I know that even in some cases, if your container that you're starting with is a std array, like a compile time or um, uh, structure, it doesn't need to be a std array. Um, Eric Eagler showed some code where he had a big pipeline of stuff and it compiled down to a single number. Like the, like the compiler saw through all the range of stuff and just like generated you the value at the end of the day, which is quite phenomenal. So compile time performance, not so great. Runtime performance, fantastic. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, for the talk. Uh, the question is that still about population. One problem I mentioned is the error, the expression of the errors in this case, type of code. Yeah. I think that uh, because of the new compiler that is hot for C20, it is an opportunity to generate more meaningful errors that are able to avoid this uh, expansion problem and give us some hazard, less great problem when we see the error. So the hope is yes. So the question was, when when looking at the compiler error messages of these extremely disgustingly nested ranges template types, um, is is there hope for that to be nicer in the future? Um, the short answer is hopefully yes, that'll get better. Uh, I know actually Vittorio has a library called Camomilla, something like that, which is like a you know third party tool that doesn't come with your compiler, but you can find it on GitHub. That actually, if I remember in your lightning talk or whatever talk you mentioned it in. You pass just a flag as like the level of nestedness that you want to see, and I think the default is like none. So it it already will like basically take your uh, your error messages, hide all that stuff for you, and then if you want to dig deeper down into it, you could say show me like the first two levels. And so like that is definitely not a good experience, but there are tools out there. Um, 
I mean, I've, I've been hearing for years that concepts are supposed to fix all the compiler messages. I haven't really seen that be the case. And on top of that, ranges showed up and they have some of the worst. And honestly, the messages are good. It's just the types that you see. Like when I first really started, you know, writing a lot of ranges code, I had to, the first time I saw, I was like, what did I do? Like, like I'm supposed to be, you know, a C++ expert. And then I, I quickly learned to just ignore that huge mess of nested template types. And at the very bottom, it'll, act, it'll actually tell you what your problem is. Um, it's just at, at the bottom of a ton of like, and if a, a Bluetooth runs into this stuff, they're going to just start crying and probably go to rust um, because their compiler messages are uh, very good. Compile times aren't great, but they do have way, way better. I mean, it's a very sad experience if anyone has played around with rust as a beginner and you do something wrong with like strings and the compiler's like, hey, did you mean this? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'll, we'll give it a shot. And then it is exactly what I meant. Um, but yeah, so hopefully it'll get better. I've been hearing for years. I mean, I saw Victoria, who's on the committee. He kind of shook his head in agreement that compiler messages haven't been getting better. But, you know. All would be like, you know, in your mold, like, not, not expect much. But if it's here to go, because it's fresh, then this guy could do. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know Eric Niebler does, one of his philosophies is that, like, good library design includes um, good compiler error messages. That being said, you can only go, like, as a library implementer, you can only do so much. Like, at some point, you need help from your compiler vendors, right? Um, but yeah, my fingers are crossed. If not, we'll just all continue to get paid while we get paid to parse this stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Now the question for all and all the other engines we produced in, in uh, the need to pass the RNA better. Yeah. And the kind of delivery. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we right, just the exit and make it step back, right? We do not have the uh, anymore. Uh, pipeline in the holes. There is a end of the color though. So yeah, to repeat the question, and I think this will probably be the last one, right? We're a couple couple minutes over. Uh, we got ex execution policies in C plus plus seventeen with certain parallel algorithms and that was extended in C plus plus twenty to I think most of the algorithms. Uh, I know Microsoft implements a ton of that stuff. And the question was uh, we're taking a step back, is that correct in C plus plus twenty and twenty three with ranges because you can't specify an execution policy. The answer to that question is yes. Uh, but the follow-up comment is that uh, companies like NVIDIA very much care about the parallelization of uh, code that is using these ranges and whether it is going to be a future language feature that is like a parallel equivalent of ranges or it will be some addition to, you know, you, like if you're familiar with like Rust or Java, both of Java 8 streams and Rust iterators have basically versions where you can like in the Java 8 streams, you just pipe like, uh, I think they don't use pipes, they use dot. But at the top of your chain, you go Java dot streams dot parallel. And then everything after that that you can call like transform and reductions is now going to be distributed across your core. So uh, it doesn't exist right now in C++23, but I can definitely say that internally at NVIDIA, there are discussions being had about what needs to happen at the committee level or at the library level in order to make that possible. So C++23, you can't parallelize your ranges code, but Hopefully in 26 or 29, it'll be possible. And then you can use it 10 years from then. Um, <laughs> all right, I think, yeah, I think we're done. So thank you so much. And uh, if you want to chat more, we find it all the way. Uh,